If you are new, I want to give you a very special welcome. My name is Ryan, uh, and you did not find the perfect church. Uh, far from it. We are a bunch of imperfect people all coming together to pursue a perfect God, and so you are welcome here exactly as you are, and we love you. We know that there are so many things that you could be doing on a Sunday evening in Austin, Texas, and so it means the world that you would give up an hour of your time to be here with us. Um, man, we love, we love what we get to do. We, we love this place, even on the, the stressful weeks and the overwhelming weeks. Has anybody ever felt overwhelmed ever in your life? That uh, probably don't need to ask that question because the answer is yes. In fact, if I uh, was to bet, I would bet that everybody in this room, if we could be honest enough, would say that there is some element or aspect of your life that's overwhelming right now, right? Like there's probably some stuff that's going pretty good, and then we probably have other things right now that are overwhelming. And when we, when we get overwhelmed, when we get stressed out, um, life has this funny way of turning the task in front of us and making it feel impossible. Anybody ever experienced that before? There's, um, there's this great quote in Apollo 13, which is one of my favorite movies, um, where if you haven't watched it, go watch it this week. They, everything that can go wrong does go wrong on, on this mission, and they have to give up landing on the moon. And they're just trying to get back home safely. Like, that's their new mission. And as they're on their way back, man, like, everything that, that could possibly be going wrong is going wrong. And they're just at each other's throats, and they're arguing. And um, Jim Lovell, played by, by Tom Hanks, stops everybody and goes, Look, there are a thousand things that have to get done in order. We're on number eight right now, and we're arguing about number 692. All right? And I can't think of a, a better way to say it like that's what happens to me in my life when I get overwhelmed. You guys know what I mean? Like, like, like maybe you're, you're just starting to come around. Maybe you're just starting to, to come by Red Rocks. You're just starting to follow Jesus. And like the, the first few weeks, first few months were, were really cool. And then all of a sudden you realize like, hey, there's like 66 books in the Bible. And some of them are like super weird and, and confusing. And I don't even know where to start. And like, how do I pray? And what's a testimony? Like, why does everybody want to keep hearing my story? What is this? Like the Enneagram, what is that? That's not even in the Bible. Why are we talking about it? Like, it's, in, like it's, it's very confusing sometimes. And it's easy to get so caught up worrying about number 692 that we forget that, hey, we're just on step eight right now. What's one step that we can take this week, this week, to get a little closer to God? Eh? You, you new parents in the room, like, like you're looking at your spouse like, hey, remember when we could just have date night like any night of the week, and now date night is 6 p.m. going through the drive through so we can get the kids home on time so they can go to bed? You know, and you're looking at each other like, like man, how are we going to get through this? Or, or some of you uh, had the third kid, and then you're switching from, like, man-to-man -man defense to zone defense, and you're looking at each other like, I don't even know, like, like what's going to happen? And then, like, one medical bill for 100 bucks comes in, and the, your first thought is like, well, how are we going to send them to college, like, 18? years from now you know because when you get overwhelmed we just start our like our minds go to this place and we, we start thinking about number 692 and we should be thinking about the next step right in front of us hey how can we win to today how can we love each other well today let's get back to the basics or like maybe it's an addiction for you and you, you just want so badly to be free you want so badly to, to, to walk in freedom and maybe you found like you made some progress, but, but then you fall back. You fall back into the same old thing. You relapse, and in that moment, man, you just feel like, dude, man, I'm, I'm never going to be able to beat this thing, and it's going to plague me my entire life, and it's going to ruin all my relationships. And right, like our minds just go to that place, and we forget so quickly, like, hey, today, let's celebrate another day of sobriety, like today, right, or this moment. Right, let, let, let's slow down. Let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. Let's get back to the basics. So tonight, I want to be like Tom Hanks. That's, I want to be like Tom Hanks every night. <laughs> but I want to I remind us, just like Tom Hanks reminded the crew in Apollo 13, hey, hey, let's get back and let's talk about, hey, what's our, what's our one step? What's our one step this week that, that we have to take? Because life can be overwhelming sometimes, and sometimes 
We just need one step. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to have some fun. Um, there is this story in the Bible that has been uh, working on me for like the last two years. I just can't get away from this story. It's teaching me all these really cool things. And like three weeks ago, I had a thought from that story about a sermon. And I'm talking to Doug about it. And he's like, yeah, yeah, let's, let's roll with that. That's good. But then a few days later, another story popped into my head. And then a few days after that, another story popped in my head. And then these guys were, were preaching last week, and I'm sitting over there, and two more stories pop into my head. And, and I, I had this thought. And if you've ever uh, given a sermon, uh, you know not to do this. And if you've ever read a book on giving sermons, they'll actually tell you to do the opposite of this. But I'm not too worried about that. What we're going to do tonight is I'm going to tell you seven stories. Okay? So this is less of a sermon and more of just story time. Don't worry, it won't be long. But we're just going to tell seven stories, and here's what's going to happen. As I tell these seven stories, you have two jobs to do. You ready? You're, some of you are, like, nervous already, like, hey, is there going to be a test? No, there's not going to be a quiz. You're fine. I'm going to tell you seven stories, and one of these stories is going to resonate with your life this week. Okay, so one of these stories is going to be your next step. So, so you can't, you're not going to be able to remember seven steps as you walk out of here, but you can remember one. So whichever one sticks out to you the most, just, just make a note of it and make that your one step this week. But number two, pay attention to, to the way that all of seven of these stories weave together because there's something much bigger going on here. And that will all become clear. The title of this message is Surrounded. Surrounded. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're surrounded by me, whether you like it or not. <laughs> I'm really excited about this. First story. Actually, Lord, would you please help us? Would you make these stories pop out of the pages? And would you teach us our next step in Jesus' name? Amen. First story, the Israelites are slaves in Egypt in the book of Exodus. And God raises up this man named Moses to bring them out of slavery and is taking them out of slavery towards the promised land. But they have a problem. They have a problem because the, the, Israel, or the Egyptian army changes their mind and decides they want to they go pursue Moses. So Moses has like, like over two million people and they're, they're trying to get out of slavery. And behind them, they have the largest army in the known world. And in front of them, they come up to the Red Sea. Even if you, this is your first time in church, you've probably heard some version of, of this story before, right? They come up to the Red Sea. And so Moses has a problem on his hands. He's stuck between a rock and a hard place, right? And, and meanwhile, he's got millions of people watching him like, all right, Moses, what's it going to be? Right? And, and I, I think that if you're anything li like me, like, man, I, some of my feeling overwhelmedness, is that a word? Overwhelmedness. Today it is. Thanks, Mary. It is because I find myself in these situations where, where it's like I'm, I'm, I can't, I'm in a catch-22. I'm stuck. I've got, I've got an army behind me. I've got an army in front of me, and there's nothing that I can do. Like, like maybe for you, it's, it's your job, right? Like you just can't stand another week in your job, and you just want to quit. You want to walk out, and yet at the same time, you've got kids at home, and you've got a mortgage, so you can't leave there. You can't leave here. For maybe for some of you, it's like a relationship is the thing that you want the most, and yet you can't stop pushing people away. And it's like the very thing that you want, for whatever reason, you, you, you like can't have. And it's like you're stuck between this and this. Or uh, maybe like, like financially, you're like, man, I just need like a little break. I just need a, a little bit of help, but, but everything that comes in I have to spend. And so I'm stuck between like this place and this place, and there's nothing I can do. So Moses has two million eyes looking at him. I guess it would be more like four million eyes if, if everybody has two. And, and they look at him, and he says this. Exodus 14, 13, it says, Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm. And you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. Moses has to stand up and remind the people, hey, God doesn't just save us and then leave us. 
God saves us, and then he gets to work in our lives. He saves us, and then he begins to sanctify us. And so we don't have to worry right now because God is going to be here fighting for us, right? Our job is to surrender and let the Holy Spirit do what he's going to do through us, right? This idea of surrender, it's like kind of counterintuitive for us as a culture, Right? Our, our, our culture is fight back, fight back, fight back. And yet story after story in the Bible is, is hey, surrender. And, and surrender makes no sense unless we're surrounded by God. And, and so maybe some of you, your, your first step today is simply this. I can surrender because I'm surrounded. I can surrender because God's all around me. He has a plan for me. He didn't just save me and then leave me. He saved me and now he's sanctifying me. And he's going to walk with me through whatever's coming next. So I can surrender because I'm surrounded. Like, like practically speaking, maybe some of you parents, uh, it's really hard to leave work at work. Right? And, and you're driving in your car and your, your boss is a jerk and you got all these, these things like piling up on your desk and you're, you're, you're pulling into your driveway and you're like, man, now I'm supposed to like go be a dad? Now I'm supposed to go be a mom? You know, now I'm supposed to like love my kids and like, like I can't voice my, my aggression to my boss or else I'll get fired. And so, so somewhere subconsciously I end up taking it out on my family and I don't want to do that, but it's just natural and I don't know what to do. Maybe your one step this week is, hey, I can surrender because I'm surrounded. And maybe you sit in your car for an extra 30 seconds just before you go inside every night this evening and you go, God's got this. God's got this. Those, all those battles, trying to fight like who said what, like, like trying to hold on to these grudges and this bitterness. It's not my battle to fight. I can surrender that and leave it to the Lord. I can surrender because I'm surrounded. I can surrender because I'm surrounded. I know it's way easier said than done. Come on. It's way easier said than done. But hey, every evening you get a chance. You get another chance to practice. And the more that we lay it down, the more that we lay it down. The work will be there tomorrow, I promise. It's always, it never goes anywhere, right? But lay it down in your car, go in and be with your, with your spouse, be with your kids. I can surrender because I'm surrounded. Story number two. Turn to the right in your Bibles if you're following along. Um, we uh, go to, to a book called Judges, Judges chapter 6. We just skipped uh, about 300 years of, of history. And we'll go in and fill the, those gaps in at, at some point. But the, the Israelites get into the promised land. And uh, before they know it, they're starting to get attacked from all sides by all sorts of different people. And in Judges chapter 6, it's the Midianites who are attacking, attacking the Israelites. And what just happens in the Bible, um, because it's a book of, about humans, is there's this cycle where uh, everything is going really well. And then the people forget about God. And then some sort of, of chaos like, comes their way. And then they repent and they cry out to God. And God raises somebody up to save them. Everything goes really good. And then they get comfortable and they forget about God. And, right? and it just goes around and around and around, especially in the book of Judges. And, and um, this, in, in Judges 6, is the fourth time that this cycle is happening. And the, now the Midianites are coming. God's people are crying out for help. And God's about to go, okay, I'm about to raise up my next guy. My next guy that's going to help us out of this predicament. Right before it was, it was a girl, by the way. So, so um, God, but this time it's Gideon. And God goes, I'm going to go raise up Gideon and he's going to help us out of this thing. So let's meet our, our boy Gideon. It says this, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak that belonged to Joash, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Okay. Background information real quick. Gideon is threshing wheat in a wine press. What this means is like, like you throw up the wheat and you let the wind come through and blow away all the bad stuff so that you're left with the good stuff. What's interesting about this passage is Gideon is threshing wheat in a wine press. He, he's underground. He's hiding. There's no wind underground. You can't really thresh wheat in, in a wine press. Translation, Gideon is terrified. Let's watch what happens says this, the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. So Gideon's all alone in this wine press. An angel of the Lord shows up and says, mighty warrior. And Gideon's like, where? 
right? Like, you can't be talking about me. I'm, I'm hiding. Like, you obviously don't know my backstory right now, angel. Like, I'm sorry, you have the wrong guy. But notice what happened in that, what the angel said in that verse. He said, uh, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. See, all throughout scripture, one of the reasons I, I can resonate with the Bible is it's a story of broken men and women and God coming alongside them and saying, hey, I'm calling you to something more. And almost every time they're like, well, I, you got the wrong guy, you got the wrong girl, that's not me. And every single time the Lord goes, no, you don't understand, I'm coming with you. And so, mighty warrior, I can call you what you're not because I am who I am. Gideon is sitting there going, you, you want me to do what now? And God's going to, in fact, the next verse, if you have your Bible, he just goes, pardon me. <laughs> pardon me? Pardon me? You ever had that moment with God? You want me to do what? Um. I feel, when, when I look around this room, man, I see so much potential. I see an incredible amount of potential. And so many of us are kind of like right on, on the verge of like really stepping into all God has for us. I think about it like, like for example, with our careers. You know, it's like, like maybe there's this opportunity on the table and this career to like, to like step in and, and, and do something big. And yet there's something inside of us that's still like, no, nah, you know what? I'm going to play it safe. I'm just going like, to keep with this little job that I have on the side because it's flexible and it allows me to, to travel and, and go be free, although we never do that because we don't have any money to, to do it anyways. right? This is just kind of like our generation, and I'm totally in this, this with us. And, and I think there's something to that, like wanting, wanting to like, stay away from, from the careers and stay away from stepping into all of that. But if we're real in this place, and let's just be real, there's also a lot of fear there too, isn't there? There's a lot of like, well, what if I try and I fail? Well, what if I try and I can't do that? Like, like you don't understand, Ryan, this whole, this whole like, yes, you can mentality, it's not for me. And so like, that's for other people. You don't know my story. You don't know what last night looked like for me. You don't know what, what, what my last year looked like for me. You don't know what my last decade looks like for me. You, you don't know me. And I think what I would say to that is, is with all due respect, I know your creator, the one who created you in his image and knit you together in your mother's womb and gave you his Holy Spirit to empower us and embolden us. And we ought not talk bad about God's workmanship. And so mighty warrior, I can call you what you're not because God is who he is. So yes, you can. Maybe we should say it like this, you can be strong because you're surrounded. You can be strong because you're surrounded. So some of you, your, your, your step this week is, hey, I can surrender because I'm surrounded. Some of you are going, I can be strong because I'm surrounded. Third story. Turn to the right in your Bible again. We're going through chronologically until you get to 2 Kings. A lot happens in between those two times. We get some kings. Saul, David, Solomon, none of them really do all that great. And then after Solomon, everything just breaks down, man. Like, if you ever want to feel better about your life, like, read the Bible. These guys, are, these guys like, seriously, it's, there's one hero in the story, and it's Jesus. And there's a bunch of broken human beings, like, like trying to figure this out and, and failing, right? And it's beautiful because it points us back to Jesus, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Second Kings, um, now there's a, another group coming to uh, attack the Israelites, and, and this group is trying to be smart. They're going, hey, um, what if we ambush the Israelites, right? Like, like we'll go, this is how I have such an <laughs> elementary mind. This is how it works in my mind. They're like, hey, let's go hide over in, in that bush, behind that bush, and then we'll jump out and we'll scare them. Right, which that's not at all what, what this, this is like serious war stuff. Um, but that's how it goes in my mind. And so this, this group's like, hey, we're going to come ambush the, the Israelites. But the problem is there's this prophet. There's this prophet um, named Elisha, not to be confused with Elijah, who is his mentor and made seminary Old Testament survey class really hard for me to pass. I'm not bitter. I'm not bitter. I just wish, whatever. Elisha, I got it now. Is, is a prophet 
uh, of God. So in a time where, where everybody is just kind of ignoring God, there's, there's one guy who's, who's really tapping in and honing in on, on what God is up to. And he's a prophet, so he can hear from God. And as these people over here are trying to ambush the Israelites, Elisha's sitting back like, hey, they're over there. <laughs> like, don't go over there. They're trying to trap you. Right? And so, so uh, the, the king of the Israelites would be like, oh, thanks so much. We're not going to go over there. Elisha can, like, see behind the scenes. And so, so these guys over here are like, well, that's not fair. Like, he can talk to God. And so we have to, like, do something about that. And so they send a bunch of people over to Elisha by night to surround him and kill him. Pick up the story there. This is uh, 2 Kings 6, verse 17. It says this. I'm sorry, verse 16. I'm sorry, let's go 15. Let's go 15. Is that good? Go 15. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Okay, so one of the servants gets up early, walks outside, goes to the shed. He gets his tools. He's heading over to the field. He's whistling. Everything's good. Wide Open Spaces by Dixie Chicks is like the, the song that's popping in my head. I have no idea what he's whistling. just makes sense. And then he looks up, and all of a sudden, there's people. There's an army to, his nor- to the north. There's an army to the west. There's an army to the south. There's an army to the east. He's looking around like, oh, no. Like, we're, we're surrounded. So he runs back inside, and he says, oh, no, my Lord. What shall we do? The servant asks, asks Elisha, and it's funny, Elisha's just sitting at the table having his morning coffee or, or whatever he does, just not, not stressed out at all. He says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And I, I wish sometimes the Bible gave us more context than it does because the, the next like, line out of the guy's mouth had to just be like, Elisha, you're a great guy. Like, really, good guy, very cool, very, like, in tune with with the spirit. There's two of us. There's a whole bunch of them. Elisha, what are you talking about? We're surrounded right now. And Elisha prays, open his eyes, Lord, that he may see. A great prayer, by the way. I pray that, that prayer all the time. God, what else is going on right now? Like somebody comes at you and they're, they're, they're heated or they're going through something or they're angry with you, they're bitter, whatever. God, what, what else is in the room right now? What, what else is happening? Elisha prays that prayer. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Right? So Elisha can see what the other people can't, and that's that, that we might, it might look like we're surrounded, but the truth is we're surrounded by God and what God is up to. And that sounds like a great lyric for a song, and we'll get there in about 15 minutes. Thank you, Upper Room. We love you guys. Shout out, Upper Room. Elisha can see what the servant can't see, and I think some of us need to start learning to see a a little bit better what's really going on here. Even when it looks like we're surrounded, the truth is God hasn't left our side, not even for a second. It might look like we're surrounded, but we're actually surrounded by him. So maybe your job this week is to say this, I can sit still because I'm surrounded. I can sit still because I'm surrounded, Or, or maybe let me say it like this. What if the thing God wants to do in your life this week exists in the silence, exists in the stillness? See, this isn't, this isn't our culture, right? Well, be silent for three seconds and see what happens. If you're anything like me, you're reaching for your phone. I got to check and see if the Rockies won again, even though I know what happened. Right? I need to check Instagram again. I need to work on my roller coaster on Roller Coaster Tycoon. Again, that's just me. I'm a child. But I'm really good at making roller coasters. I really am. Whatever it is. Right? It's like what's happening there. Maybe maybe this is what's happening. We have a whole lot of pain down here. And there's a whole lot of stuff 
going on down here, and it's just not very comfortable to go see that stuff. So instead of seeing it, we just cover our lives with all sorts of noise so that we don't have to go there. And maybe this week God's giving you a little challenge to go, hey, I've got you surrounded. I've got your back so you can sit still because I've got some divine editing I want to do in your life. Like, I want to go to that pain, and I want to show you that it wasn't your fault. I want to go to that spot and remind you that I still loved you, that I was right by your side, even in the middle of, of the craziness. I want to go to that place with you. Let's go through the pain, and let's get to the other side. I can sit still because I'm surrounded. Keep turning in the right in your Bibles. Fourth story. Stop at Proverbs 22. Sorry, Proverbs 17, verse 22. This guy named Solomon sat down at some point in his life and wrote out a bunch of sayings, and this is one of them. A cheerful heart is good medicine. He's going, hey, man, we take ourselves too seriously sometimes. It's okay to smile. You guys, it's okay to smile. I can smile because I'm surrounded. Fifth story. <laughs> Go to the right. Fourth story, I'm sorry. Fifth story, who knows. Mark chapter 2. Let's get to Jesus. 800 years has gone by. Including 400 years of silence. Nobody's heard from God. And then this man comes on the scene declaring that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he says, I am here to proclaim good news to the prisoners. I am here to set the oppressed free. I am here to restore sight to the blind. And he actually starts doing it. And, and as he goes, as he goes and does this ministry, like everybody just wants to be around whatever is going on in his life because he's actually doing it. And he's inside this house. And the house is, is completely full. Like there's no room for anybody else to get into this place because everybody is, is just trying to get in, in Mark 2, verse 3, we meet some, some crazy guys. It says this. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus, because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the man on the mat. The mat was, uh, sorry, lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, Circled there, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, there are layers to this story, layers to this story. And we'll come back to it a, a bunch as we go throughout the years, um, starting with the fact that uh, this guy gets lowered in. Poor guy can't walk. Jesus looks at him and he goes, son, starts with identity, your sins are forgiven. And you got to be thinking at some level, everybody in the room, including the guy on the mat, must be thinking, that's cool, can't walk, you know? Like, can we do something? And yet maybe there's something so much deeper going on to any physical healing that, that Jesus ever had to do. But more about that some, some other time. I want to stick to just the surface level, like practical reading of this story that we just read. Um, I, I wrote here, I have written in my Bible, surround yourself with people who will cut holes in roofs for you and then go do the same for them. Right? This guy is surrounded by <laughs> Diane like that. Thanks, Diane. This guy is surrounded by four other buddies. You get the feeling that these five guys just like, go everywhere together. They're just like probably kind of rowdy guys that do some pretty ridiculous things sometimes. But they're like, oh, he's our fifth. We just carry him everywhere that we go. He's, he's, he's like a part of the crew. Let's go. And then they see an opportunity for him to get healed. But they go, we can't get in there. And they all start to, you know how it is. Like, like guys, when you're together and you're like, somebody throws out a crazy idea and everyone's like, <laughs> hey, but like seriously, I bet we could probably cut a hole in the roof. You know? And they, they like slowly start talking themselves into it. They go up to, to this roof, start cutting a hole somehow. The owner of the house has got to just be like, guys, come on. Like, there's an easier way to do this. But, but they, they cut the hole in the roof. They, they lower him down. And it says when Jesus sees their faith, he says, son, your sins are forgiven. And if you know the story, he goes on to heal him. And the man stands up that day and walks out. Now, when he gets home that night, 
after a crazy day. I feel like he lays his head down on the pillow and goes, I, like, I can walk. That's amazing. My sins are forgiven. That's incredible. And then I feel like his next thought before he dozes off into a deep sleep is, I have the best friends in the world. Like, I have the best community in the world. And I can stand because I'm surrounded. Right? Like, like, listen to me. Life is too hard to not have people in your corner. Life is too hard to not be surrounded by like-minded people who are ready to walk this thing out with you. And, and like, like, next week we're launching life groups. We're launching life groups because this is one way, a way, for us to try to say, hey, here's a way that we can get a bunch of people in your corner with you so that you don't have to be alone. Because sometimes you might feel strong, sometimes they might feel strong, but as long as somebody feels strong, I can be strong. Because if you're strong, I'm strong. All right? And, and, and I don't care, listen, I don't care if it's a life group or if it's like something you do through work or if it's young life or it doesn't matter. I don't care what the, the avenue is. I just care that you have people in your corner, people in your life who will walk this thing out with you because I'm telling you, there are going to be days where you need somebody to carry your mat for you. And if you're sitting here going, ah, not me, man, I'm great. How about this? There are people who need you to help carry their mat. So would you please get in community because we need your strength. We need what you bring to the table because if you're strong, I'm strong. And so we can do this together. I can stand because I'm surrounded. Sixth story. And Ben, you guys can come on up. It's the only time you'll turn left in your Bible. Sorry. But chronologically, we're still moving forward. This is the end of Jesus' life. I'm the only one who cares about any of those little details. <laughs> Whatever. This is the story that I think is going to tie all this together. Um, this is the story that's, that's been on my heart for a couple years now. Um, and, and so to, to review, we had, I can surrender because I'm surrounded. But then we had, I can stand. So I can surrender. God loves me just the way that I am. But I can also stand up and move forward because he also loves me too much to leave me where I am. Right? I can sit still because I'm surrounded. God's got me. I can sit still right here. But I can also stand because I'm surrounded. The other one was be strong. I messed that up. And we usually have two services to get this thing right. I only got one, so here we go. <laughs> it's, I can rest because I know how much God loves me. But also because I know how much God loves me, I can get up and get to work. And it's both of those things back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So for this last one, we've got Jesus at the end of his life. And, and um, they're out in this, this garden, this garden of Gethsemane, and like everything is going crazy, and, and things are falling apart, and these, these men come to arrest Jesus. And this guy named Peter, who, man, I just re resonate with so much. There's a little story about him right here. It says, then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions, we read in John's gospel that it was Peter, reached out for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Peter sees everything they've been working for for the last three years start to, start to fall away from them. He's going, we've done so much, Jesus. We've gone so far, Jesus. Now these guys are, are here to take it all away from us. No, I'm not going to have it. I'm, not, I'm ready to fight. I'm, I'm ready to do something about this. And, and the next verse, the next two verses are two of the most profound verses in the Bible. Jesus says, put your sword back in its place, Jesus. Jesus said to them, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. And then listen to this. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more, more than 12 legions of angels? Jesus goes, Peter. You're striving. You're trying so hard. Trying so hard to do everything right. And Peter, I so appreciate that about you. But don't you see, Peter, 
All of heaven has my back. I'm surrounded. I can snap my fingers right now and be out of this in an instant. I'm surrounded by all of heaven, Peter. But here's the thing. There is something so much bigger going on right now. There is a story, and I know you can't see it right now. But the thing is, the wages of sin is death. And so you know what? Let them come. Because tomorrow I'm going to go trade my life in for yours, Peter. I'm going to trade my life in so that you can go free. So, Peter, you can stop striving because you're surrounded by me. You're surrounded by my death and resurrection, and your salvation is found in me. So I got you, Peter. Put your sword away and stop striving so hard. You can stop striving because you're surrounded Man, I gotta just be thinking that, that, that Peter's sitting there trying to like take all of this in, trying to figure out what, what all of this means. And we know from, from context, if you've read the story, it takes him, it takes him a few weeks. But when the truth sit, sinks in that we're surrounded, it changes everything. Like for us here, Red Rocks, Austin. Listen, I going through that Philippians study, I, I got to study Paul going into Philippi and planning a church where there were no other churches. And it was like giving me anxiety for him. The thought of going into a place where there are no other churches is so terrifying because we've been here for a year and all of these churches, this body of Christ and this beautiful city have just welcomed us in and with open arms going, hey, we're going to surround you guys because we're all in this together. Like just Wednesday, we lose a space. Within a few hours, Northwest Fellowship's like, hey, we're strong, so you can be strong if we're strong. Come on, we got you guys. You're surrounded. John, I wasn't going to tell the story. John David is sitting right over there, and uh, we had breakfast. John, sorry, I got to do it. We were having breakfast the week that I was preaching my first sermon here. And we get out here, and I'm all confident. I got my swagger. I'm ready to plant this thing until it's time for me to preach. Big insecurity of mine, by the way. And we're sitting at breakfast, and I go, bro, this omelet's delicious. I can't do this, though. I can't get up there. And, I don't, like, everything I had prepared, I was like, it's, it's, it's garbage. Everyone's going to hate it. He starts praying. He starts praying, and as he's praying, he, he starts, starts speaking this over me. He goes, hey, you just got to be like a vending machine. You got to be like a vending machine. See, everything that the vending machine needs is already inside it. You just got to let what's inside of you already come out. And, and, and I start bawling in the middle of this restaurant, and here's why. I came to Austin thinking, man, I'm pretty creative. Like, like we've got a pretty good team. We could figure out a way to do this. And that'll get you a little ways until it won't anymore. And it'll leave you desperate at Kirby Lane Cafe, wondering what in the world you're doing. John David comes in and he says, we need to make a mental shift right now. If you think this is about you, your creativity, and your effort, you're wrong. God called you here, God put you here, and God equipped you in the way that he needed to equip you. Your job <laughs> is to just go be who you are. Go be authentic and let the Holy Spirit work in this place. So I'm sitting there and I'm bawling. And John's, David's just, just, just praying, praying. And the waitress, they always come at like the worst time, you know. And she's like sitting there like filling up my coffee. I'm like, thank you, I'm sorry, I'm stable, I promise. It's not right now. Come to Red Rocks or something. Um, we get to do what we get to do because we're surrounded. I told all the volunteers before everyone showed up, just looking around the room, like how amazing is it that we get to walk this life together with all of our friends and we get to do it side by side with people that we love. And in the meantime, God's going, hey, I got you guys. I got you in the palm 
of my hands. And so I'll call you mighty warrior, even if you don't feel like it, because I can call you what you aren't, because I am who I am. And so let's go and let's do this thing. We can be strong because we're surrounded. We can surrender because we're surrounded. We can stand because we're surrounded. We can sit still because we're surrounded. We can smile because we're surrounded. We can stop striving because of what Jesus did for us. So seventh story. This guy named Paul gets it. Like that truth, that gospel truth starts to sink into his soul. Doug said this two weeks ago. Then he said it again this morning in Denver. So I thought I should, I should say it one more time. In Acts 16, he gets arrested. He gets thrown into prison. Left alone in this, this, this dungeon, this, this prison cell. They throw him down there because they, they can't get him to shut up. And so they think, well, maybe, maybe we'll just throw him in a prison cell and he can just hang out with the rats down there. Maybe that will silence him. There's this beautiful passage. This beautiful passage. Put it up on the screen. Acts 16, it says this. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. The other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken at once. All the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. Paul understands that even if he's in a prison cell by himself with a bunch of rats and his buddy Silas, the truth is he's actually surrounded. The truth is the Holy Spirit is right there walking with him through that. And so even though his, his feet might be chained down to the floor, his hands are still free so he can raise his hands and he can sing. He can go, I'm going to sing my way out of this one because I can sing because I'm surrounded. And what happens when he starts singing, man? What happens when he starts worshiping? What happens when he starts going, no, God, to you be the glory. All of a sudden, that's when the earthquake comes. That's when the the chains come loose. That's when they walk out of there as free men and women. And I just wonder tonight if maybe some of us, to bring this to a close, if some of us need to go, you know what, my step this week is I just need to keep singing. I just need to keep singing until the chains fall off. I just need to keep worshiping even if I don't feel like worshiping. I just need to keep giving God the praise no matter what's going on in my life. I can sing because I'm surrounded. The truth is God is here and he cares about each one of you. And even if you're here and you you can't quite wrap your mind around that yet, I promise you it's true. I promise you it's true. If you ever want to talk to any of us about what that means, come find Doug or Ethan or or myself. We would love to talk all about what that means in your life for the rest of us. And I just feel like as we meet together with this family reunion, the 4 p.m. and the 6 p.m., we just need to sing into the next stage of our church. So in this moment, we're going to sing the song that inspired this whole talk about how we are surrounded by what God is doing. And in this time, I want to invite you maybe even for the first time, to just open your heart. Open your heart to to the possibility that, that the creator of the universe, the one who created you and knit you together in your mother's womb, might just be crazy about you, might just be in love with you, and might just be willing to say, ready to say, hey, all that stuff from your past, don't worry about it. All, all that stuff from yesterday, don't, don't worry about it. I finished that. You can stop striving because I, I finished that. Now we've got work to do. We've got somewhere to go. We've got somewhere to go. There's something to do. It's time to stand up and fight. So let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Would you guys stand with me? Father, I love you so much, Lord. I thank you for this church. Lord, I thank you that I am surrounded by my best friends. I thank you that I'm surrounded by family right now. I thank you that you are here surrounding all of us. And I want to pray right now in the name of Jesus for every soul in this room, for every soul in this room, that you would come and let them know that you are right here, that you are right here and you are ready to, to talk. You are ready to to, uh, mend, you are ready to fix, you are ready to redeem, you are ready to set prisoners free. And as we praise you tonight in this place, Lord, we pray that you would get the glory, that prisoners would walk out of here free. We love you so much, Lord. It's in your name we pray all these things.